Hallelujah. Man, sometimes it's just so good to put your hands up in the air with our hands lifted high. I like that line because it makes me put my hands up in the air. I know not everyone's like that, but you know, I feel weird seeing that seeing that line and not putting my hands up. It's weird. My hands lifted high. <laughs> but I start to hurt. I'm not going to lie. My shoulders start to hurt after a while. It hurts so good, right? <laughs> oh, man. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that today your message comes through despite me, a broken vessel. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those of you who can, please do me a favor. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Who can do that for me? I appreciate that. Well, today we are kicking off a brand new series, uh, but before we dig into the nitty-gritty of circles, it's always good to take a second to take stock and get the lay of the land to get a 30,000 foot view and reassess our situation and reevaluate our mission, right? Periodically, it's good to do that. See the forest. Oh, there's a forest, right? Sometimes we get lost in the details. So uh, just a few framing questions, right? Where are we? Oh, United States of America, Maryland, Fulton, any of those answers are correct. That's actually where we are, right? 12350 Hall Shop Road. This is where we are. Uh, the reason why that's important is because location is important, isn't it? Sometimes location uh, can determine a lot of different things. Uh, we've talked about uh, cultural, uh, cultural gestures before, right? There are certain things that we do in our culture that, that would be offensive in other cultures right? Location is everything, where you are. That is, uh, that communicates as well. So that's important to know. That's where we are. Now, when are we? You know when we are? 2019, good. I like it. All right. It's a Saturday, <laughs> right? It's morning, <laughs> presently. That's also really important too. When we are is really important, right? Uh, interestingly enough, when we are is framed by, by Jesus himself, isn't it? 2019 reminds us of when Jesus was around. Uh, it's fascinating how, how so much of what's around us, uh, the education system, uh, how we keep track of time, all actually points back to Jesus in so many ways. Um, but this is also, right? What a time to be alive. It's a very technological era. Some of you probably would have had, you know, no clue of some of the technologies that are available today, right? And in five years or ten years, our minds will be blown again, I'm sure, by what happened. So when we are is actually really important, too. We're post-industrial revolution, right? Most of us drove cars to get here that were likely uh, assembled uh, thanks to right, assembly lines. So there was a promise with technology. And uh, it was that we would become more productive. You remember this? Right? Technology would make us more productive. In fact, that's our first slide. Let's go to it uh, yeah, before I forget. It would make us more productive. And in fact, we would have more free time. Right? We'd have more leisure time. And we'd also have more quality time. Time to be able to invest in, in the things that are really important to us. But that's borne out to not be true. Are, are you less busy? <laughs> because of technology? We've actually filled it up with more work. Instead of working less, we're, we're working more because we can get more done. That's the time we're living in. And what's interesting is, 
at some point, there is a law of diminishing returns. Has anyone here experienced that? The law of diminishing returns? Some of you work and work and work and work. And at some point, the word work starts to look really weird because you've been staring at it way too long. <laughs> Wait a second. I'm not quite as productive as I thought I was. Now, at this point in time, in history, the United States is not the most productive country in the world. We're not. We are sixth. We're outranked by five other countries. Here are the countries that are more productive than the United States of America. First one is, who knows what that is? Iceland. Iceland, right? Iceland is number five, more productive than the United States, per capita, right? Okay. What's number four? Number four is Denmark. Now, Denmark, their average work week, do you know how long it is? Now, the United States of America has a 45-hour, our average is a 45-hour work week. Some of you are thinking, wow, that's a lot. Some of you are like, wow, I would kill for a 45-hour work week. Denmark's average work week is 33 hours. More productive. Number three, or number, let's see, five, four, three. Number three is Switzerland. Switzerland. Their average work week is 30 hours. 30 hours. And then, number two is Norway. Their average work week is 27 hours. More productive. Any aspiring Norwegians here? <laughs> and then the top, the top, right, country is that tiny, tiny country right next to Belgium. Oh, wow, what is that? Whoa, I've never seen that flag before. What is it? <laughs> L-U-X. Luxembourg. Yeah, it's, usually it's just way too, right? The word's too long to fit on that tiny piece of real estate. <laughs> but Luxembourg sits at the top, and their average work week is 29 hours. And every year they have they average five weeks of paid leave. Now, each of these countries, each of these countries values a work-life balance. And so they have built it into their culture to be able to do that. More isn't always more. And unfortunately, with, with technology, a more productive life, that, that was an unfulfilled promise. And we're not. We're not more productive. We're less productive, and we are not just less productive, we are also more distracted. That's, that's technology, right? Have you experienced this? I know I have, personally. Maybe I'll just speak for myself. But I'm more distracted. In, in the book he wrote, Cal Newport wrote a book called Deep Work. And in it, he describes the cost of distraction the little distractions that come up. And there are a couple of different ways this happens. But if you're sitting down and, and working, right, focusing, trying to get something done, and then, bing, little notification pops up. Ooh, someone liked my Facebook post. It takes an average of 15 to 20 minutes to clear the cobwebs and then get back to work every time that happens just to get your mind right in the proper space. And those notifications are going off all the time because you're really popular. But that's what ends up happening. And in fact, some people here, right, might be multitaskers, might actually be multitaskers. I'm not. There is no way I'm a multitasker at all. But in his book, he actually writes about something called attention residue. And what ends up happening is if you're focused on a project and you leave it before it's finished, there's actually an attention residue 
that, that functions the same way as distraction. In fact, it takes, it takes about 15 minutes to really clear your head of that last project and then focus on this new thing. So if you're fluttering around from project to project for whatever reason, it's not really working. And I've lived this. So in addition to productivity, technology has promised more connection, right? Wasn't that the promise of social media? More connection? I've connected with friends that I hadn't seen in years. I used to tell this story about this kid uh, in first and second grade. Because I wasn't a very large person in my class. But in first and second grade, we had a big guy in our class. His name was Greg Black. And Greg Black and I were buddies. We used to hang out, and he was like, he was like a protector. I was hanging out with Greg because no one could touch me when I'm hanging out with Greg. I used to tell this story all the time in churches, right? And just about a month ago, I got a friend request on Facebook. You know who it was? My man, Greg Black. <laughs> I hadn't talked to him in years. So the promise of social media was more connection, right? So now we're like, oh, wait, I knew this person in high school. I knew this person in college. Let's connect. Right? So now you've got this huge friends list because you're so popular. But what we've discovered is that more connection actually isn't, isn't actually happening now, is it? It's a lot of lurking happening. That's a nice way of saying stalking, right? But that's happening for sure. Is that actually connection? Is that deep connection? There have been a lot of studies now at this point on social media. And even two years ago, which is ancient in, uh, you know, uh, in the time frame that we work with, time is so compressed now. But two years ago, they were doing uh, studies on teenagers and social media. And they found that teenagers who spent two hours or more a day on social media were less happy, more prone to anxiety and depression. It's not a huge, it's not a huge surprise, I think, for many of us here. Because remember, there's that old quote, right, by the Theodore Roosevelt, that comparison is the thief of joy. And what's social media? It's just digitized comparison. Wow, look at them. Look where they went. Look what they ate. Well, this guy's always eating. And he never gains weight. <laughs> How is this possible? That doesn't make any... Oh, oh, I see why. Because he goes to the gym. <laughs> but that's all social media is. It's comparison and comparison in comparison, and here's actually what ends up happening for us when we engage with this. There are chemicals in our brain that fire off. Every time we get a little notification, there's a little shot of something called dopamine. And dopamine feels good. This is the chemical when you finish a task, right? And you have that checklist, and you're like, check. That feels good, right? Just check. Or maybe you cross it off. Maybe you're like, Done. I'll be honest. Sometimes I write stuff I've already done just so I can cross it off. <laughs> right? Do the laundry. I did. <laughs> what else have I done? <laughs> That's totally me. But that is a little shot of dopamine. And what happens is every time you get a little notification, right, and you see that little red badge, you're like, wait a second. A little shot of dopamine. It feels good. It feels good. However, what happens is it's, it's an incentive chemical, and it encourages repeating behaviors, right? So this is one of the reasons why, you know, as, as a people, as a species, we're very goal-oriented. Hashtag goals, right? We're like, yes, achieve, do this, do that, because the dopamine is firing. However, what ends up happening is instead of being more connected, we're disconnected. 
Because there's another chemical within you called oxytocin. And oxytocin serves a slightly different function. Uh, in his book, Leaders Eat Last, Simon Sinek refers to oxytocin as everyone's favorite chemical. Uh, this is the feeling of friendship and love and trust. And this function's slightly different. Now, we seek after these kinds of connections, deep connections, right? Because you've got a really big friends list, but how many friends do you actually have? We're like Lego bricks. At some point, we can't have all these deep, meaningful relationships. We're like, you know what? I've got this much time, and these are the people I'm going to invest in. And that's true. And those people, that's where the oxytocin is firing. These are the people that I trust. These are the people that I'm willing to share life with, right? These are the people who are going to tell me the truth and speak truth into my life, and I give them permission to do that. We seek after these kinds of connections because they can bring a stability to life that helps us weather the ups and downs of life with assuredness, right? Not least of which is our relationship with God. That's the stability we get from God. And here, look at this text. John writes to us, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is assurance of salvation. You can know with no doubt that you have salvation. That's not heretical to say. I know. I'll I'll stand here and I will tell you I have no doubt in my mind that I have salvation. Because of who God is, who Jesus is. And that brings a stability and assuredness that is so deep and full of oxytocin that I just don't have to worry. When God writes that, right, when he tells us that in Scripture, I can believe it and I can trust in it. We have a problem right now, like in, like this, in our place, in our time, where we are. Our problem is, this, there is a lack of moral knowledge right now. It's just, there's a lack, a dearth. That's a good word, right? It's just not, it's not there right now. It, it's, it's missing. It's not just a lack of morality, it, because this is an age of fluid ethics, right? It's like, ah, it's right for you, it's right for me. But this is, this is slightly different. Moral knowledge is moral knowledge in the sense that we can speak into a situation, not just with words, but with an apologetic of our lives, right? You're living this thing. You're living it, and, and we are, that operates on the foundation of integrity. You bring it to bear with who you are, right? Because of who you are, the words you say mean so much. That's what we're talking about here. This is the moral knowledge that we are just lacking in our society. Can I get some kind of witness? Now we have an ethic, as Christ followers, we have an ethic built upon the knowledge that we've received from the Bible, but filtered through an honest and humble hermeneutic. Here's what that means. For example, the Bible gives us our moral knowledge. We read it from the Bible, but we have to be honest about how we read this book Because some people say, hey, the Bible says this, and you're like, yeah, you're right, but you forgot that they were in a time and a place, right? So we have to be honest about how we read it and humble and ruthless regarding the baggage that we bring to the text. We bring a lot of baggage. Why? Because I live in Maryland in 2019, that's why, right? Because I grew up in the 80s, that's why. (laughs) Because I'm sinful, (laughs) that's why. They go down all the list. I bring a lot of baggage when I read the Bible. There's a lack of moral knowledge at this point, and this lack of moral knowledge has led to a lack of empathy. That's, this is the time we're living in. It's a real lack of empathy about caring about other people. I'm a dad. 
I'm trying to raise a couple men. And I want them to have this. I want them to have empathy. I want them to care when people are suffering. That's important. And right now, we are not seeing an awful lot of that. That's a problem. Empathy is so crucial for so many reasons within a community. It's the ability to imagine the situation of another person and feel what they feel. And that's who we're called to be. Now, here's what's interesting. Empathy is one of those things that you, you can't help but think, where does it come from and can you grow it? And what they found is that you can grow empathy. You can increase it, right? Are you curious about how? How do we do that? How do we increase empathy? And there's actually a, a practice. They're doing a little more research on this. Writing fiction increases empathy. Did you know that? Writing fiction. Why? Because you have to take on a perspective that's not your own. And by doing that practice, they're actually doing some research into simply reading fiction. But I think writing actually engages on another level. So writing fiction, if you or your kids or someone, you want to grow empathy, right? This is a good practice. In fact, if, you, if you're interested in this, I might have a little exercise online. We'll figure that out. But yeah, growing empathy, writing fiction. It's really interesting. Uh, and in this book that Sinek wrote, uh, he says that empathy is the key component of good leadership. Would you agree? An empathetic leader? Someone who can feel what others feel? That's what this has led to. A lack of empathy has led to this. There's a lack of leadership. I mean, real leadership. We're just... Because there will always be positional leadership. There will always be that. There's positional authority. But at this point, as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as most of we are concerned, authority is earned and not given. Look at this saying. This is what Sinek said. This is good. A boss has the title. A leader has the people. Agree? Some of you work for bosses. They're like, yeah, that's true. A boss has the title. A leader has the people. There's a lack of leadership right now in the time we're living in. So this was a really, this was an important 30,000. Do you feel high? Right now we're kind of looking at everything. Wow, leadership, that's missing. Empathy. There's a lot going on. Let's talk about New Hope now. Right? Let's, let's come back to where we are. If this has been a picture of the world we're living in, what are we doing here right now? Right? Obviously, you're listening to me. I thank you for that. Thank you for, for listening. But part of our tradition says that when things get bad, we hunker down and we hide. I, I have an admission. I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. Right? I love it. I love being Seventh-day Adventist. But part of my uh, growing up process has been being very afraid of things because there's a time of trouble. Have you heard? And when that happens, it's time to run and hide. So I hope, you, I hope you're good at hide and seek because not the seeking part. We don't want any seeking, but we want the hiding, right? Because when things get bad, hide. And that's part of my tradition growing up. It's like, uh-oh, when things get bad, then we, whew, cut out. But I want to take a look at some words Jesus said, because that's always helpful, isn't it? Here's what he says. Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a, a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is like the opposite of being hidden. He's saying there's a town, and it's up on a hill, and everyone can see it. And that's actually just how it is. 
And there's something that, I've read this text for, you know, 30 plus years. I'll let you do that math. I'm 40, whatever. <laughs> Why, yeah. I haven't been reading for 40 years. That's my point, that's my point. <laughs> But there's something that I totally missed, and I didn't read until, until I was reading this again for this, specifically. It's funny how that happens. Sometimes there's something in Scripture, and it's been right in front of your face the whole time, and you just never saw it there. It's that word right there. Two words before light. Light your let. Let. Here's what's interesting to me. I read this and I thought about another text. There's a text in John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. You remember this one? And I remember as I, I thought about that text and contemplated it, the whole point of John 15 is for the branch to remain in the vine, right? And what's the byproduct of doing that? Just fruit. You'll bear fruit, fruit that will last, right? That's what Jesus talked about. You will bear fruit, fruit that will last. And I thought, if I'm the branch, then what do I have to think about as a branch? Now, obviously, branches aren't thinking much, right? No nerves there, no neurons. But if I were a branch, right, anthropomorphize the situation, the whole idea is, as a branch, my job is to remain in the vine. That's it. Because it's not like I'm a branch and then I'm like, ah, fruit. Like that doesn't happen. We don't see branches out here laboring. Ah, oh, that branch, man, look at the effort that this branch is putting in. It's incredible effort. I know it's going to be such good fruit. No, this is what the branch does. The branch is like, remain, 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 fruit. Remain, remain, remain. More fruit. That's actually it, right? It's this focus on remaining, and the fruit is simply a by byproduct or fruit. That's actually what happens. As I was reading this, I saw that word let. Letting requires no effort at all, just let what it says right let your light shine right we sing that song right this little light of mine right let it shine right you're doing the motions putting a lot of effort into it when really there's just let just let it's happening but you know what requires the effort is that next verse hide it under a bushel no Oh, well, look at all that wasted effort. Why are you even trying to hide it when you're just going to not do it again? Just don't do it in the first place and you're fine. You can skip that whole verse. By remaining in Jesus, your light is shining. Like it just, that's it. That's what happens when you're in his presence, when you're with him. It's happening. Just let it happen. It requires more effort to be like, no. No, don't shine. It requires less effort just to focus on Jesus and to let it happen. It requires no effort to let something happen. None. There's a reason why this is important. Because here at New Hope, our mission is to help people live out the kingdom wherever we are. That's what we do here every single week. That's why you hear the messages that you hear. We are trying to help you live out the kingdom wherever you are. But it's not just our mission as a pastoral staff. It's our mission as a collective group. Because our hope, our goal, is that when you leave this place, this will still be your mission. That you will help people live out the kingdom wherever they are. We recognize something. We pour into you every single week because you pour into others at home and at work, at your hobbies, right? Wherever you go, there you are, and you are 
pouring into people. That's happening. You're changing somebody's world every single day. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your coworkers. Maybe it's your students. Maybe it's your boss. John Maxwell wrote, he coined the phrase back in the early 2000s of a 360 leader. And a 360 leader is someone who, regardless of positional authority, can lead in every direction. So even if you're in middle management and you have a boss, so what? You're still called to be a leader and to lead that person. And that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do here. That's the project every single week. And it underscores this point because I am currently in a room that is full of leaders. There isn't just, you know, one leader or a few leaders. We are all leaders and called to be leaders in the kingdom and for the kingdom. Here's what that means. That means you are called to lead in your context, whatever it is, at work and at home and at school, all, on all levels. Your role is to impart the timeless and eternal principles of the kingdom translated into your context. That's your job. Your job is to translate it wherever you are. Right? So if you're in a situation where like, it's not cool to talk about God, that's okay because you can still show them God without saying a word. Just translate it into that context, right? You don't have to say God for it to be God. But to lead well, especially in the realm of moral knowledge, in our context as Christ followers, here's what that means. Here's what we've learned. To be a good leader. You're all leaders. We've established that. But if you want to be a good leader... Good leaders are good followers. And that's especially true for us as Christ followers. But this was true even for Jesus himself. Look at what he said in John chapter 5. Jesus gave them the answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. Then again, in John chapter 8, look at what he says. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. Jesus, the greatest leader of all time, the greatest leader the world has ever seen, and I'm not saying arguably, Jesus was arguably the greatest. He actually was the greatest leader. I, I kind of referenced it earlier. I mean, even, right, 2019. When I say 2019, every time I date that, that is a little reference to Jesus Every time I write that down, yeah, Jesus was here, guys, 2019, remember. There's so much in our culture that actually goes back to him. His, his impact on this world was timeless. He was the greatest leader who ever walked the face of this earth. And he was a great leader by following. That's how he was a great leader. We're not better than he is. He's our model. And so... As we follow Jesus, he calls us, all of us, into the creativity and the freedom of his kingdom. And that's what that is. Now, that freedom isn't about doing whatever we want, though. Right? So, I don't know what your picture of freedom is. Right? But for some, it's like, I, I can't remember where I read this now. You know, over the course of this, I read so much, I can't remember where everything is. But there was... Um, there was something I was reading that was talking about freedom, and it said, freedom isn't some kid just doing whatever they want in the corner. That's not freedom. I know my kids are here. You hear that? Yeah. Not just doing whatever they want. Freedom is watching a master pianist play effortlessly, drawing everyone in to their craft, making you feel the music that they're playing. That's true freedom. Or watching a master builder, right? Work their craft, or a master painter, or a master architect, or a master accountant. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? But it's operating in, in that. That's what freedom is. Where there's so much 
there's so much discipline and so much understanding and such a depth of knowledge that it comes easy. That's freedom. It's not just doing whatever you want. It's about being, and this is what the fr- freedom in the kingdom means. It's about being his hands and his feet in a world with love and with skill. Right? Being good at being his hands and feet. It's about imparting moral knowledge with creativity and with empathy back into this world. About 20 years ago, there was a phrase that was huge in Christian culture in America. Some of you may have had the wristbands. Some of you might still have the wristbands. Remember this? It was a little framing question we all had. We were so cool. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And then you had that friend who'd be like, man, Jesus never dealt with this. (laughs) He never dealt with the internet, man. (laughs) He was never addicted to the internet. (laughs) He never had to deal with these synthetic drugs that we're all dealing with. (laughs) There's something about this saying. I, I, I get where it's going, but it's trite and incomplete in certain ways. But here's a better phrasing of it, and it was Dallas Willard who who came up with this. And I really latched onto it. Here's what he said. He said, instead of what would Jesus do, how about this? Who would Jesus be if he were me? If he were me, who would he be? It's a different question. It's not just about the things that Jesus did. If he were an associate pastor at a fantastic church in Maryland in 2019, who would he be? If he were a school teacher in suburban Maryland, right, with kids of all kinds of backgrounds and cultures, who would he be? If he was a nurse, right? Working for a difficult boss in a tough environment, who would he be in that situation? In your context, who would he be? Because you are unique. God has gifted you in a very unique way. You're specially equipped to lead in your situation wherever you are for your family for your co-workers for your situation so i do have an appeal today Uh oh (laughs) back to circles right that's this series don't worry we have a few weeks to develop this circles are small groups that's what circles are but leaders are needed where can I find leaders? If, if only I had a room full of leaders somewhere. See how nervous that is? You're like, wait a second. He said, we're all leaders. We're all leaders. <laughs> you are a leader. So here's my appeal. I don't know if I esta- established that well enough, but you are a leader. God has called you to lead in some capacity you're actually already doing it in a lot of ways. But here's my appeal. I'd like to ask you to commit to pray over these next few weeks. Just pray, all right? I don't need you to sign, sign up for anything yet. But if you would, do me a favor and just pray about maybe what God is calling you to. Ask God about what he wants you to do in response to this. Just ask him, okay? I'm not gonna tell you what to do. You ask him. And... Um, and here's a little bit, if, for those of you who right, need to be held accountable, it's a little bit of accountability. You can go to this website. You can access it right from our uh, page, newhopefulton.org. There's a little button there that says circles. And if you, if you want to commit to this process, I want to invite you to go there. You could go there now if you want on your phone. And you could just say, hey, yeah, I'm willing to pray about this over the next few weeks. I have no idea where it's going to end up. God might be like, yeah, dude, not you. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to argue with God, but maybe he'll say something that none of us expect. Part of being a good leader is being a good follower. So I'm going to trust you in your relationship with God, okay? So if you're willing to do that, and um, let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for this room filled with leaders. And clearly, we're, we're lacking things here in this world. We're lacking leadership. We're lacking empathy. 
we're so distracted. There's a lot that's going on right now. And, and what's at stake is nothing less than our own lives, the lives of our kids. There's a lot going on right now. But God, I just pray that as a community, that you would be the one to show us the way about what it means to follow you in this culture, in the midst of this culture, and not to be hidden, but to actually just let our light shine so that you can be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name.